Hello and welcome to COVID-19 right now from the Yale School of Public Health. I'm James Hamblin. I'm a lecturer here at the school and I am very fortunate today to be joined by Saad Omar. He's the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health and we are talking unsurprisingly about COVID-19 but specifically mostly about vaccines today uh, and a, a lot of his work has been a, a, at the forefront of that, obviously something that's on everyone's minds. Um, if you have comments and questions for us, please drop them in the uh, Facebook links, you know how Facebook works, and we will uh, get to them. We would love to take the direction, take the conversation, whatever direction is helpful. Um, Saad, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm somehow not hearing your audio, but that is a feature of modern life. Yeah, no, no, so, so the oh, most uh, okay. frequently used uh, six words these days are, uh, you know, press your, click your unmute button or whatever number of words they are. So sorry, I was on mute. It's humanizing. Um, so uh, I like to start every one of these conversations just by, you know, we're live, things are changing, feels like day to day, hour to hour even. What is just at the front of your mind right now in terms of the most pressing concern or what's keeping you keeping you awake at night so yeah so the, the phrase that i've been sharing with friends and colleagues is that we'll be cleaning up this mess for a while and here's what i mean there's been a lot of uh misinformation and disinformation around the virus and increasingly around vaccines that are not even there and when that kind of an intensive um misalignment between facts and what's out there happens, uh, people who do this kind of stuff for a living end up cleaning up the mess created in these kinds of emergencies for, for a long, long time. And that's what's making me nervous. What, what kind of misinformation is, I, I assume you might be alluding to vaccine hesitancy or however you would yeah. phrase it. So, so both, both generally speaking and um, and more specifically around vaccines. For example, I don't, you know, these things, uh, these, you know, sometimes I call them zombie ideas. They keep on coming back. Uh, for example, it's just another flu. Or even if it's flu, it's more um, severe form of flu. No, it's not the flu, uh, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so that, we know that there's substantial evidence of that. Now that flu is um, not serious, uh, especially pandemic flu, but this is, this is a different kind of a beast we are dealing with. Right. The other, the other sort of zombie idea that keeps on coming back is that let people get infected and develop herd immunity. And, and I'd be able to come back to that concept of why that's not uh, the best idea. Why, uh, you know, it may sound smart in your head, uh, but, but if you think through it, um, it's not the best of ideas, but it keeps on coming back and we keep on spending time um, sort of countering that. Uh, and then, but coming to vaccines specifically, uh, one of the things that has taken hold or has started to take hold is the fact that, you know, because of the, the need for an, a vaccine, which, because that's our end game to return to normalcy, uh, the, the process has been expedited, but it doesn't mean that we have cut corners in the things that actually matter. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, sort of on the, we need to continue to emphasize that on, uh, as a vaccine research community on an ongoing basis, but then that speed has led to these uh, perceptions in certain circles that we are actually skipping important steps, which is not true. It's just that the process uh, efficiencies are being emphasized so far, like at least, you know, uh, so at least this far in the development process uh, rather than skipping steps, et cetera. Yeah. So I think the common forecast that a lot of people have heard from Dr. Fauci and others, it keep, we keep hearing 12 to 18 months um, what does that mean to you? Does that sound right? And what, it, uh, what sort of expectation is reasonable within that time period? So I think uh, that's a reasonable sort of median estimate or a point estimate if you, if you were to ask me in terms of when the vaccine could be available um, uh, in terms of which is, yeah. you know, so that time frame. However, there's a huge uncertainty bounds um, around that estimate. It could be sooner or could be uh, later, much later than that. 
And, and, and look, I wish I had sort of a better answer to that, but that's the nature of the beast. The good thing is there are a lot of things that have gone right uh, uh, so far in terms of biological development, et cetera, early start of trials and so on and so forth. However, there are several steps to go. Um, and, and so I, you know, again, sometimes cringe, to be very honest, when colleagues, especially researchers, et cetera, sometimes make these rosy predictions because uh, based on the track record of vaccines, it's the nature of the game that approximately eight out of 10 or nine out of 10 vaccines that enter human trial don't see licensure or are not widely utilized. So the, the, the good news is that we have a large denominator, but there's need for optimism, but cautious optimism and un, a, a reasonable level of uncertainty around this, our best guess. Okay. Um, we, and we, just to clarify, when you say, uh, when we have a vaccine available, does that mean something that is kind of fresh into production and available to it's a small group, but would take a long time to scale, or do you mean fully s scaled and widely distributed? No, so when people talk about that, it's a, it's a licensed vaccine. So that's the estimate for that. But, but you are alluding to a very important question uh, because that's the start of the journey um, for, for the process of vaccination. So, it's, uh, so vaccination is, is, you know, that the whole process, the building a system, et cetera, takes time. But good news is um, there has been some parallel work on developing and evolving and task shifting, et cetera, in terms of manufacturing capacity. For example, um, Bill Gates uh, and, and the Gates Foundation decided that they are gonna look at what's out there. There are certain platform uh, technologies that are out there that are being developed. Some are more promising than others. And they're gonna invest in production lines and our sort of production uh, facilities with the idea that even if one of them is actually utilized, it's not money wasted, or, or that they, if they waste that money, it's still worth it if you gain time. So that's smart, and only a private entity can do that. Uh, similarly, in India, the uh, Serum Institute of India has said that they are going to build capacity and actually start manufacturing doses of the Oxford vaccine even before the trials are completed, so that if the trials are completed and this thing is licensed, they can distribute those doses quickly. So they're doing it at a lot of risk. Um, so, so having said that, that, that you know, so th these are things that are important, but there are signs of hope that people are taking these process, the process bottlenecks seriously and investing in manufacturing earlier on. But that's not the end of the story, and I'd be happy to come back to the other steps uh, that are needed to get a vaccine from a vial to an arm. Right, right. Um, it's, it sounds like there's a lot um, that requires coordination at high level, like global levels, as well as national levels. A lot of what we've talked about in um, terms of this response in the short term is state level, local level approaches, and that's gonna inform contact tracing and restrictions on social distancing and what can be let up when. But when you come to vaccine development, you're talking about needing to do things on much larger scales. Um, so uh, do you feel like the US is positioning itself in, um, in, within the global health community in a way that is safe or what do we need to be doing better to be as ready as possible to, to make the vaccine available once it exists? Well, there are a few things. Uh, first of all, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll step back and tell you what, what are our best bets in terms of getting a vaccine and getting it out there. There's an entity that was established after Ebola that, uh, you know, a few uh, wise old men and women in the vaccine and global health world said that this is unacceptable, that every time there's a big outbreak of these viruses, you know, we then look around and search for a vaccine and scramble, et cetera. Why don't we develop? We know that there's a finite number of entities or types of viruses that can cause pandemics. So Ebola, Marburg, uh, Nipah, uh, and in terms of coronaviruses and pandemic flu, et cetera. And then there are certain things that don't even require uh, 
from a scientific perspective, the actual antigen for half of the journey or a, a, a long part of the journey. So you develop that platform and then you modify it for specific uh, vaccine antigen. So based keeping that on my, in mind, they created this entity for, um, it's called um, Collaboration for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. I'm not 100% sure about what the acronym spells, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, but it's CEPI essentially. And so sometimes when you internalize the jargon, you forget what the original <laughs> words were. But I think it's pretty close to that. So CEPI is an international entity that was created for developing these kinds of vaccines uh, and say and other technologies, other countermeasures, which were, um, um, uh, you know, these countermeasures uh, meant that, uh, you know, and, and these vaccines that, that you invest in these vaccines earlier on, you know that if there could be a coronavirus vaccine, which coronavirus that remains to be seen, you do early phase development and then modify it and repurpose it and, 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 and do that. Sure. They, they're a relatively new entity. They had started doing that. And they, have, they get funding from uh, you know, entities like Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust, but mostly from sovereign governments ranging from Nor uh, Norway to Ethiopia. Guess which government is conspicuous by its absence? Make a wild, wild guess yeah. in, in funding CEPI. That's our government. It's the U.S. government yeah. uh, that has been out there. And, 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 and so that's a, that's a problem. We can afford to do this. Uh, when you are spending $2.3 trillion uh, on, on sort of mitigating the impact of an outbreak in a single bill, and the next uh, legislation is... Um, slated to be in the vicinity of $3 trillion, uh, you can't nickel and dime things that will bring you back to normalcy. So that's one thing. Then there is this international effort for ensuring access that people pledge that we're gonna pool our resources, make advanced commitments, et cetera, shape the market. Guess which country was absent from there? The US. But the US is thinking, there is some thinking that we don't need the world um, and we are going to. We have so much talent, so much technology, so much manufacturing capacity. We're going to do it ourselves, and we're going to arm twist manufacturers into coming uh, here, and we're going to develop our own thing. And the the, the so-called Operation Warp Speed. And you know, as much as I like uh, sci-fi, uh, not the best name, but you know, setting that aside. And, and, and focusing on developing it internally. There are a few things that we should be concerned about. First of all, the entity that leads, that serves as the government's venture capitalist plus vaccine and countermeasure manufacturing arm is called BARDA. And that agency uh, that, is, that was created um, uh, through bipartisan support to be ready for this has made, has the muscle memory to develop things fairly quickly, et cetera. It uh, kicked into full gear during the last pandemic. Guess what? Uh, the, the, the director was fired or transferred to NIH because people didn't see uh, the, the, point, the, the value of the input he was providing. So BARDA has, you know, obviously the whole agency is not fired, but when you have leadership change, there's an instability there. Mm -hmm. And so you are looking at that and you are saying, okay, we're gonna work internally, and we're just going to focus here and everything will be hunky-dory, that's dangerously naive because it's a denominator game. It's a numbers game. The more you spread your risk in terms of the number of products, number of technologies, number of supply chains, um, the better it is. So we should absolutely have internal investment in our own program in the U.S., mm -hmm. but we should absolutely not be absent from global vaccine development efforts. And here's the thing, here's the irony of it. Uh, people who, a lot of people who started CEPI or who were brains behind CEPI were Americans, are Americans. Actually, one of them had passed away, uh, but you know, uh, but, but they were, uh, so, and even now the technical workforce has, uh, has a lot of American representation. So, 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 so when I say um, that it's dangerously naive not to invest in these multilateral efforts, this is what I mean, that you are, the, the fewer products you have, the higher the risk you have in one of them being successful. 
um, yeah, it's a bleak, it's a bleak picture that you're painting in terms of the U.S. position globally. And I know at the same time, just we, um, leadership is also antagonizing and blaming other countries and uh, blaming World Health Organization and not exactly building up the sort of alliances that would help us if a, another country is indeed the first to have an effective vaccine and we need to work collaboratively. Um, so that that is scary. And also, I think to something you sort of alluded to before, the idea of misinformation and, and campaigns of fear that I'm hearing also that people might not, you know, large numbers of people might not take the vaccine, they might not trust it um, when it is available. Um, Partly that might be due to, some people might have legitimate concerns because of the time, but we're, we're trying to do this faster than ever before. And some people have proposed accelerating things beyond the normal capacities. But uh, as you mentioned, safety precautions will need to be a highest priority, continue to be the high priority. And so you'll also have people who just simply are, have a conspiracy theory in their head. How are you thinking about walking that line of making sure that we're moving as fast as possible because people are dying daily, thousands of people, and yet also ensuring um, the requisite safety wherein we simply can't take a decade here to do this and guarantee that um, beyond a shadow of a doubt there could never potentially be a single complication. How do you think about that, that calculus? So both at the procedural level and more pragmatic level, but also at, at a philosophical level. Um, you know, so I, I have the privilege of uh, leading some of the efforts. So I lead a working group uh, as part of being a member of a, um, a longstanding vaccine safety committee at, at WHO. I'm uh, sort of uh, leading a working group to uh, put in place plans for safety evaluation and ensuring that for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and the idea behind that is that you don't, uh, philosophically speaking, that you don't cut corners. Uh, you make sure that you do it with intellectual integrity that, uh, and transparency of, of, of the scientific process, uh, then whatever you know, risks and benefits are, they're explicit. Um, so that's how you do it. And you let communications not drive your science uh, in terms of then the most rigorous science. So that's the first thing, you do the science first, you elicit the benefits as well as the risk, and then you communicate honestly, truthfully, um, you know, in a way that supports public health goals. When, but on the other hand, you can't be naive about the communications effort. So once you have ensured that the vaccines are safe and you're transparent about it, you should look at the, uh, the best practices, the evidence base on risk communication and unfortunately, at least at the WHO level, these efforts are running in parallel, that you ensure that these vaccines are effective as well as safe, uh, but also communicate effectively and, and communicate about their safety, et cetera, using principles that we have learned over the years. Do you have an idea of exactly how safe a vaccine needs to be in order to guarantee adequate public uptake, which is to say people will hear some stats like that are thrown around, like one in a million people might have some sort of complication. And even if a disease is much, much inordinately worse than that, um, there's something about the active act of, of taking on vaccine that makes people feel like they, uh, it, it alters the risk calculus. So, no intervention we do in medicine is perfect. Even, you, even people can overdose on <laughs> water, there can be contaminants in anything. Nothing is, nothing is perfectly safe, but how, how safe do you, does something have to be before you think the public will take it up at a large enough scale um, and that it will be effective? So there are two parts of this question. So first is based on science itself. Uh, so how safe it needs to be to, for, to be recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a separate question than a communications question. So there we, we need to be hard-nosed about the risk-benefit ratios and we have benchmarks, et cetera. And it depends on sometimes if the safety profile, the risk-benefit, most, 
in, in all vaccines that are routinely recommended, the risk benefit ratio doesn't even come close. Uh, you know, it's, it's heavily in favor of benefit. Uh, but I could imagine in certain scenarios where that ratio is closer, but you are looking at a catastrophic event where with, um, you know, consent, people could take a vaccine that has higher risk, just like cancer therapies, et cetera. Um, so in those kinds of situations, someone um, who is at a really high risk of exposure might, you know, consciously take those decisions. But we are looking at currently, our goal uh, is to maintain the same imbalance between risk versus benefit, heavy, heavy imbalance in favor of benefits versus risk. And, and all the signs I've seen point to the direction that that's where the development is going. So that's the first thing. But then the other part of this is how do you communicate? So it doesn't matter. So people have looked at these studies. It doesn't matter if you present the risk one in million, one in 10 million, et cetera. People did these studies, head to head comparison of these vignettes when, when they said, uh, what would happen if you don't take the vaccine and the disease happens, give the same risk, uh, give a certain risk uh, you know, a probability to that uh, event occurring. And then you say, uh, what happens if you take the vaccine um, and you, you, know, you develop this side effect or adverse event. That varied the, the, the frequency and the probability by tenfold and, and even higher and didn't matter. Uh, you know, after a, a certain level of numerator denominator, we lose perspective. We are really good linguistics, uh, but uh, li very good linguists, but really bad statisticians intuitively. A four-year-old child will tell you the difference between sadness and boredom. And if you ask me, even me, who has looked at vaccine safety data, viscerally, intuitively, I can't tell you the difference between a risk of 10 million and a, a risk of one in 10 million and a risk of one in 100 million. It is rare, but, but you know, that degree, we're not hardwired to do that. So mm -hmm. what does happen? Like what works? People have then tried narratives of impact, of severity specifically, of outcomes, both side effects and the disease itself. So that would be part of communications. And you don't go beyond data. Uh, and if, if this is a severe disease, we should be able to communicate that. And the best practices say that you do that with messages of self-efficacy and response efficacy, meaning that you could have a pretty risk of getting intubated and dying of this disease uh, you know, it's not majority, but still it's a substantial risk uh, out there. Uh, but you can do something about it. You can, you know, when the vaccine becomes available that you can take a vaccine and this vaccine is effective. So that's the strategy you, you use. But there, there, there's a, another insight that was developed through these studies and a lot of these were done in the UK. When they compared, gave the same narrative of severity to both groups, um, side effects group and disease group, if you don't get vaccinated, people still, you know, if these things were made equal, they chose the option where they didn't have to take an action. So vaccination was still behind the non-vaccination because people have this omission bias that they don't want to um, commit something, commit an act and regret it rather than let things take their course. So what is the lesson in, in terms of communication? So the lesson is that you establish a norm and you frame non-vaccination as an active action or decision than the act of vaccination. So that's, these are some of the evidence-based strategies and going back to your question, this is, this is how you communicate. Right, right. I'm wondering if um, this, poses, this vaccine poses any particular challenges in your mind, just in terms of narrative and communication, which is my interest. Um, in terms of, there's already an issue in this country of parents not vaccinating children for diseases that pose potentially very serious risks to the child themselves. This is a disease that where a very small percentage of children have severe disease, um, but it's critical that everyone get a vaccine for the preservation of life among people who are chronically ill and older and might have very high risk of dying of this. Do you see an added layer there in terms of public understanding or perception where it's not even where a child might be at a very low risk and yet it'll be personally, and yet the value of them getting vaccinated will be huge to society? No, no, I agree. So th this, is, this is complicated. 
Um, and, uh, and I wish we had simple answers there, uh, but we ha will have to be, so there are a few things we'll have to do. So, you know, the things that I mentioned use evidence-based approaches, but also be radically transparent and judicious about recommending vaccination. So if the, if the vaccine is for preservation of normal life, we have to be explicit about that. So the risk benefit threshold is, again, it, it again becomes more heavily in the, uh, uh, you know, your, your threshold for adverse events goes down if you are doing, if you're asking parents to vaccinate their children for maintaining herd immunity, that's a different threshold than if you're asking someone who's a healthcare worker to say that you should take it so that you're protected for individual protection. So we'll have to have that nuance in policy making, but also radically transparent communication uh, with different risk groups, et cetera. It's not just, just that, uh, that this vaccine is being recommended, but why it is being recommended for this specific group. And yeah. even in children, you know, we are unfortunately finding out that there are these inflammatory, ostensibly inflammatory syndromes uh, that pose a pretty substantial risk. So there is increasingly, it, it may unfortunately end up being a moot discussion because that even if it's not as, as high a risk in children, but it's significant event, it, it ends up being significant event, sorry, significant enough for us to warrant uh, vaccination for their individual protection as well. Right, right. Um, we have a question from a, a viewer here, and if anyone else is watching, we can take maybe one or two, and uh, then we'll wrap up. But uh, a, a viewer asked, "Do you think our aversion to quality life, quality adjusted life years, has uh, handicapped our, our national response?" So you saying aversion to quality adjusted life years? Yes, that is the question on the table. Yeah, so 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 that's a really good question. I think part of the reason why we don't use that is because once uh, an event becomes catastrophic, uh, the discussion becomes less technical and more societal. And we haven't, as a society, had these discussions around quality. What does that mean to have that kind of calculus in healthcare decision-making in terms of allocation of resources and so on and so forth? At the healthcare level, so if you look at the, unfortunately, I, I, I never wish any any health system or any individual physician or uh, you know other clinician has to take any actions in terms of rationing, but the um, but the uh, frameworks that are out there uh, that I think more frameworks that people are using uh, at the more technical level are you know in their essence utilitarian um, and 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 qualies and dollies etc are in their essence utilitarian frameworks. Uh, so, but beyond those technical decisions, uh, major societal decisions require, if they are going to be that uh, utilitarian, their orientation and the required nuanced thinking is to have that societal discussion and we haven't had those, uh, that discussion. And that, that is the reason why um, I, I don't think these um, matrices are used as often as some people would like them to be used. Right, right. Um... And someone else asks about uh, the current three-phase reopening plan. Specifically, do you predict us jumping back and forth between phases over the course of the next year, including things like like travel restrictions? And what 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 is your projected forecast there? Well, so here's the thing: uh, unless get, we get really really lucky in terms of the weather having uh, the, the weather is likely to have some impact but the expectation is it's not gonna wipe out the virus uh, totally. Unless we have those kinds of pleasant surprises, uh, and by the way, it will not go away even if the weather had, has major impact. I think it, a lot will depend on, so uh, in this uh, virus, and those of us who do this for a living, we have been following this since January, for example, the virus has been less unpredictable than human and policy actions. Um, and I say that, that with some deliberation. Um, and so therefore, what happens when, how these phases go will depend a, a lot more on the actions of policymakers and how they're implemented as compared to the virus itself. And, and the virus characteristics, uh, at least epidemiological characteristics have stabilized in terms of our understanding 
uh, has stabilized in the past month or so. There are other still clinical features and all sorts of other things that are a source of uncertainty. So going back to your question, or the viewer's question, uh, I think the likely scenario is that there may be some tweaking of these things, opening, closing, et cetera, not to, uh, to the extent, but it will also depend on what do we do when we uh, buy a time. One of the, the sources of consternation some of us have, like look, I tweeted about it in March uh, about you know, a, a four step strategy that included testing and contact tracing, uh, reducing home-based transmission, having a drug that reduces uh, ICU stay, and then preparing for vaccines from now because that's the end, end game. Um, and then sort of we published it in JAMA. Others have, now there's a cottage industry of plans that is out there. And I sometimes say that, you know, if a professor doesn't have a plan, irrespective of their background, it could be, you know, they could be a professor of baking. Uh, if they don't have a plan, they should return their tenure because everyone and their mother has a plan to open up uh, the society. But, but right. you know, setting aside, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the the the, the you know, somewhat funny part of uh, of the uh, part of the fact that everyone has a plan, there are common features of these plans, and one being that we need to have a testing capacity paired by contact tracing and isolation, and or some version of identifying these outbreaks early, mass screening. The other permutation is mass screening, and then um, isolation, and and so on and so forth. We haven't utilized the time we bought. Frankly, we kept on going into these diversions of these flights of fancy of uh, of this herd immunity strategy. Look at Sweden, and when look at Sweden, Sweden is not doing that well compared to its peers, etc., and so on and so forth. And, and and then there was other like frankly, there's a lack of leadership at various levels, not just federal level, where it, which has resulted in us not being prepared. But eventually, uh, you sometimes uh, you stumble your way into success. Uh, but sometimes that success comes after 80, 90, 100,000 lives. So we will build up capacity and we are building up capacity for testing. When that happens, the next wave will not require, may not require as drastic an action as we did earlier on. So we may have to have tightening and loosening of these restrictions, but we can afford to be a little bit more strategic about it. But again, the biggest variable has been human action, not the virus. Right. Um, I also, I, I, I get a lot of questions about reopening as well. And it seems that in a lot of industries, a lot of features of life are not, we're not going to simply start yeah. air travel exactly as it was or start even schools exactly as they were. When we do, they, they will be um, improvements to do things in a better and safer way. And certain aspects of things will come back um, certain aspects of education, the education system will come back while other parts may not fully come back right away. And I think it's kind of just adjusting to this idea that everything's going to be at least slightly different for quite yeah. some time, as opposed to when does everything, what is the hard date when everything goes back to exactly as it was? And <laughs> so, 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 so I have a nuanced answer to that. Yeah. Uh, so First of all, yes, it's not, even if vaccines become available there, we, we will have to have certain measures. They may not end up being this drastic because of the reasons I described, that we are, even if we are late, we are getting to certain benchmarks. But things will not be normal until we have a vaccine. And even after that, there will be long-term changes in terms of, you know, I expect people to, you know, maybe we'll have a sort of an American version of Namaste or something, like it would go beyond yoga studios um, you know, as as it's or a nod or a head bob or whatever, a greeting which doesn't require contact. So there may, there may, there may be long term changes. There may be a, a change in how we structure society, etc. But I have started hearing about a few, like a sense of despondence um, here, that we will never be normal. That we may the last thing we know that will be sports events to open up will be major like sports events with crowds uh, is what I'm talking about, uh, you know, large gatherings and so on and so forth. So, so we, we, we have heard about uh, that and that is indeed true that that will be the last thing to open up, but it will open up. Uh, and when it, what will get us to that level of normalcy, uh, even if it's a new normal, but it will be uh, based on human contact is a good, safe, effective, widely used vaccine. 
And right. we should not talk about a permanent state of social distance because that would be detrimental uh, to us as a civilization, as a race, as a country, uh, as a community. We are social beings and we absolutely have to. And, and I will do every, anything, everything in my power as a vaccine researcher to make sure, uh, and obviously I'm just but one researcher and one scientist, to make sure that we not only have a policy goal for preservation of, of, of life, but of preservation of joy. Because we, I was supportive of early shutdowns, et cetera, but that's not a permanent state of things. Right. We have to be a society that gets to go to, um, to, to Broadway shows. And as, as well, I was saying that I would love to go take Amtrak, go to Baltimore and get my heart broken by the Orioles once more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. as I, uh, you know, if things become normal. Yeah, um, that's a great place to close, to bring it back to the narratives that you mentioned in the beginning, you know, that I think there is a narrative out there that uh, public health advocates and experts in, want things to be shut down or enjoy this. And no one wants this. No one, everyone knows it's not sustainable long-term. Everyone is trying to find ways to quote unquote reopen. And uh, we're just following the science and the evidence and the time-tested approaches to dealing with these things. So thank you for, for your work and for your guidance on this. And I, uh, I hope you get to see some baseball uh, <laughs> before too long, but I'm not going to put a date on it. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Take care. Oh, thanks.